The 90s and early 2000s were a paradise of simulation games. Games that enabled the player's creativity while also allowing them to balance a large number of spreadsheets and spinning plates were all the rage. Within the last few years, this genre has begun a renaissance. Games like Planet Coaster, Prison Architect and City Skylines have taken the games of old and thrust them into the modern day. One of the titles that has fallen by the wayside after many years as a bestseller and fan favourite is SimCity. So what happened to it? In this video, we'll take a look at the rise and fall of SimCity. Would you like to win yourself a City Skylines DLC? I'm giving away three codes to three lucky winners for any DLC of your choosing. To enter, simply head on over to bit.ly slash tmcitiesdlc and follow the instructions. In 1989, American video game designer Will Wright released SimCity. He was inspired after creating his first game, Raid on Bungling Bay, a top-down war shooter. The game was designed to fit into the existing market. Wright used conventional mechanics and themes to build a game like others on the market. The game was built using a technical trick. Upon moving from the Apple II to the Commodore 64, Wright learned a method for scrolling smoothly over what appeared to be a single massive background image and enabled the system to look like it could load a great deal more than it really could. The game was sold to Brodebund Software, who published the title in 1984, selling a reasonable 30,000 copies. It had been a decent number had the story ended there, but it did not. Hudson Soft, a Japanese publisher, bought the rights to Raid on Bungling Bay from Brodebund so they could release it on the NES. Supposedly, the game sold an incredible 750,000 copies on the NES. This amazing success gave Will Wright a steady income so that he was able to invest more time into his next project. It enabled him to take some risks and not rely on making a game that was guaranteed to sell, a game that would break the mould and offer players a brand new experience. Wright found that he enjoyed designing and creating the locations within the game more than the combat mechanics that the title offered. He theorised that players would also love the ability to create their own cities and thus the extremely basic looking SimCity, initially called Micropolis, was released on the Commodore Amiga and Macintosh. SimCity was the first of its kind. Wright had taken a leap to create a game that he loved and he hoped would find an audience. He initially struggled to find a publisher for the game as most publishers including Brodebun doubted that a game with no win or loss conditions would go down well with the fans. So instead, he decided, alongside an acquaintance he'd met at a pizza party, Jeff Braun, that they'd found their own publisher to release SimCity under, and thus, Maxis was born. However, this little company could not go it alone. They needed help. They needed a distributor. So Will Wright went back to Brodebund and asked for help. Brodebund convinced Maxis to add a set of optional scenarios to the game, a number of time-limited challenges that the player could meet or fail, and thus giving the game definitive win and loss conditions. With this implementation, Brodebunda happily agreed to become Maxis's distributor and look after them in the cutthroat games industry. The game was a smash hit and took the world by storm. Wright looked at his game not as a conventional gaming experience, but more akin to a dollhouse or a train set, an open-ended interactive experience that put the power in the player's hands and left the fun up to them to create. The term the community would later adopt for this being the term sandbox. Will Wright's passion project had become a sensation. It had launched a new genre of video games and taken over the world. In 1991, SimCity celebrated its second anniversary on the market while still topping the charts as the best-selling computer game on the market. Five years after its initial release, the follow-up SimCity 2000 released and expanded upon the winning formula, introducing a range of new features and a new look isometric view to replace the top-down view of the original. The follow-up was a more serious and more complicated simulation game with less focus on the win conditions that he'd been forced to implement with the original. The release of sequels did not, however, slow the sales of the initial title. Maxis renamed SimCity to SimCity Classic and continued to sell and support the title. In total, the original SimCity sold half a million copies on the PC, with the Super Nintendo version selling a further half a million copies. When you add in the Commodore 64 figures, it was clear that SimCity was one of the biggest titles to hit gaming in a long time, and it was here to stay. However, all good things falter at some point, and SimCity was no exception. Maxis pumped out more and more SimCity titles as the years went on. SimCity in 1989 was followed by SimCity 2000 in 1993, then SimCity 3000 in 1999, SimCity 64 in 2000, and then a further two SimCities in 2003. Games became more and more frequent, and less and less inspired and ambitious. The community began to lose trust in Maxis, as each new version of the game offered very little in terms of development and improvements. 
I'd argue that part of SimCity's problem is that it was so influential and inspired many of its contemporaries, not just in the sim builder genre, but in vastly different genres as well. The inclusion and focus of creativity and player led gaming can be felt around the industry. When asked in 2008 to name the three most important innovations in the history of electronic gaming, Sid Meier listed one of them as SimCity, saying, You can see traces of SimCity in many, if not most, of the games we play today, from casual social games to hardcore RPGs and strategy titles. Maxis first went public in 1995, and for a time, between its public offering and the sales of SimCity 2000, the company prospered. However, after a number of failures and poor business decisions, the company found itself in dire straits and needed saving. The company pinned its hopes on SimCity 3000 to save them. The game would unfortunately release disastrously, as SimCity's first foray into the realm of 3D led to computers being unable to generate the power to run the title. After a disastrous E3 in 1997, and on the brink of financial ruin, Maxis began to search for a buyer. Electronic Arts came to their aid and spent $125 million in a stock swap to save them. Following this purchase, EA began removing upper management in the months following as they found a company with low morale sitting on a gold mine. So they took towards writing the sinking ship as they worked towards their next release, SimCity 4. SimCity held the title at the top of the urban simulation video game genre for over two decades. SimCity, SimCity 2000, and SimCity 3000 were huge global successes, after the latter had got over its initial issues, and SimCity 4, released in 2003, gave players even more creativity, enabling them to develop mods and add custom designs into the game, essentially giving the title an almost endless lifespan. And that's how the series sat for 14 years. The community kept SimCity 4 alive, with modders and designers on websites such as Simtropolis and SimCity Devotion numbering in the hundreds of thousands and the custom creations in their millions. The community was happy with what they had and kept with the game from 2003 while the rest of the industry moved on. Nine years later, in 2012, Maxis and EA announced SimCity, a rebrand of the series using the Glassbox engine and bringing SimCity into the modern day. Buzz was everywhere and everyone was excited for the new king of sandbox games. However, Excitement turned into bitter disappointment as more and more changes were announced by the studio. Modding support was severely discouraged and unsupported, the ability to create custom buildings was removed, the game would be online only, and maps would be locked at a size of 4 square kilometres, which was around the size of the smallest maps in SimCity 4. With so much controversy around the game in the lead up to the release, it was imperative for EA and Maxis to be prepared for launch day and have a smooth launch to ease fans' frustrations especially considering the title was coming out just after Diablo 3, which had suffered from the same controversy and had had a disastrous launch. Unfortunately, 2013 SimCity suffered the same fate. Servers did not work on the game's release day. For many players, it took up to a week to even be able to play the game they had paid $60 for, and EA had to further new to the game and remove features just to get it to work. Fans were not happy. The official forums were full of angry critics writing long and well-crafted complaints analysing the new features within SimCity and specifying why they were a mistake. Unfortunately, the developer refused to buckle to community pressure and make any changes whatsoever. Maxis and EA made a great number of mistakes on 2013 SimCity. Mistakes on what fans wanted, overestimations on their game engine, and a lack of polish left fans angry and disheartened. However, I feel the biggest mistake they made was not supporting their modding community. Maxis' SimCity 4 had been kept alive by the dedicated modders continually pumping out new, free content to fans, and I think Maxis underestimated the impact this had on the game's success. They had one of the most talented modding communities in gaming, and they essentially threw them to the curb. Maxis would pay the price for these mistakes. Mere months after the game's release, the studio in Emeryville that developed the title closed its doors for good. Things went from bad to worse for Maxis, when a competitor saw the angry community of loyal fans and decided to capitalise on Maxis' mistakes and provide fans with what they wanted. The small developer from Finland named Colossal Order announced City Skylines a year after the release of SimCity. The developer announced that City Skylines would be able to be played offline and they would offer support for the modding community on launch day. Colossal Order and the game's publisher Paradox are far smaller than Maxis and EA, but it didn't matter. City Skylines became a global success overnight and sold half a million copies in the first week and more than 6 million copies since. Colossal Order kept things new and exciting 
with new DLC every roughly six months for the past five years, and most importantly, a dedicated modding community that has kept the game fun to play since launch day, with hundreds of thousands of items to download and mods to use for free. City Skylines saw an opportunity and they took it. And now, they are the undisputed kings of the urban simulation video game genre. SimCity is all but dead, and whether we'll get a follow-up to the title remains to be seen, but it looks unlikely. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video then please do subscribe for more content, and if you'd like to support me then head on over to Patreon via the link in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.